Um, now we are very much privileged to welcome the presenter of the keynote lecture of the seminar, Professor Dapo Akande. He is Professor of Public International Law at the University of Oxford and a member of the United Nations International Law Commission. He is one of the authors of the Oppenheim's International Law and also has published on various areas of international law in leading international law journals, including the American Journal of International Law, the European Journal of International Law, ETC. He has also acted as counsel and advisor in many international disputes, including before ICJ, ITLUS, and WTO. At today's keynote speech, he will discuss the immunity of head of state, which is an exciting topic of the day, especially considering the time that we are in. Please join me in welcoming Professor Kande. Professor Kande, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here in Tokyo and taking part in this international law seminar. And um, as has just been said, I will be speaking about the immunities of state officials, and particularly with respect to prosecutions for international crimes. And what I propose to do is to have a look at where international law stands today with respect to, with respect to that question. I know that on Monday, you had a discussion, many of you did, with Professor Philippa Webb, looking at um, state immunity, diplomatic immunity, and consular immunities. Here, I'm going to be focusing on the immunities of the officials of a state, as opposed to the immunities of a state in, in general. Now, earlier this year, in particular on the 17th of March, 2023, the International Criminal Court, or the ICC, issued arrest warrants for Vladimir Putin, the president of the Russian Federation, and also for someone called Maria Lvova Belova, who is the Commissioner for Children's Rights in the office of the Russian president. The crimes in those uh, warrants, the crimes that are alleged in those warrants, relate to alleged deportation and transfer of children from territory that is occupied by Russia in Ukraine. And those acts would constitute crimes under international law if they are proven. The warrants that were issued by the ICC were then sent to the 123 states that are parties to the statute of the International Criminal Court. And those states ordinarily have obligations to cooperate with the court including an obligation to arrest and to surrender to the ICC those persons that are wanted by it. Now, neither Russia nor Ukraine is a party to the statute of the International Criminal Court, which is the treaty, as you know, that establishes the court. However, the court has jurisdiction over acts that occur in Ukraine because Ukraine has accepted the jurisdiction of the ICC. So that means that the court has jurisdiction over conduct that occurs on the territory of Ukraine, even if that conduct is committed or has taken place uh, by nationals of states that are not parties to the ICC statute. So the court has jurisdiction over the actions of Russian nationals which take place in Ukraine. So that's the jurisdiction of the court. However, the question of whether the court may prosecute the head of state of Russia and the legal effects of the arrest warrants that were issued for Vladimir Putin raise different questions under international law. And in particular, they raise the issue of the immunity of heads of states and other senior officials under international law. So the question that is raised is whether Putin, as head of a state, not party to the ICC statute, is subject to prosecution by the ICC, and also whether ICC parties can arrest him were he to enter into their territory. Now, this issue is particularly timely because as we speak, 
There is a summit going on in South Africa, which is the BRIC summit. So Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa having their summit in South Africa as we speak. And that summit is taking place at head of state level. South Africa is a party to the statute of the ICC. And so ordinarily, South Africa would have obligations to cooperate with the court, including obligations of arrest. And for that reason, as you probably know, President Putin decided not to attend that summit in person. And in fact, he gave his address to the summit last night by video conference rather than in, in person. And there have been questions in South Africa as to whether South Africa would indeed have A, had an obligation to arrest him, and B, whether they would have gone ahead to arrest him had he traveled to South Africa. Now, in response to the war in Ukraine, it has also been proposed that, in addition to the ICC prosecutions that I've spoken about, it's been proposed that a special tribunal for the crime of aggression should be established to prosecute those senior Russian leaders that bear responsibility for the use of force in Ukraine. This tribunal has been proposed because the ICC does not have jurisdiction with respect to the crime of aggression committed by nationals of states that are not parties to the ICC statute. And Russia is not a party to the ICC statute. I should note that even amongst those who support the establishment of this tribunal, there is a division of views as to whether this tribunal should be created as an international tribunal, or rather as a so-called internationalized tribunal, so which is essentially a national court that is established with international support. So maybe foreign judges are uh, added. However, if this tribunal were to be established on either model, international or internationalized, the question would arise as to whether the tribunal could exercise jurisdiction over a head of state or over other senior officials. In short, would the tribunal have to respect the immunities that international law accords to foreign heads of state? So these are the questions that I wish to address in this lecture. So to what extent does international law accord heads of states and other senior officials immunity from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction, in particular when such leaders are accused of international crimes. I'm going to focus on the situation before the ICC, but I will also speak about immunity from the exercise of criminal jurisdiction by foreign states since this is an issue that has also been raised recently. It's worth noting that one of the topics that is currently on the agenda of the UN's International Law Commission is the immunity of states, uh, the immunity of state officials, sorry, from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction. And here the commission, the ILC, is looking exclusively at immunity of state officials from the criminal jurisdiction of other states, so from national criminal jurisdiction. Okay, let's now take a step back and look in general at the picture with regard to immunities of state officials in, in international law. So international law accords two broad categories of immunities to state officials from the criminal jurisdiction of foreign states. So first of all, there is a category of what you might call personal or status-based immunities. And the Latin phrase is immunity ratione personae. And this applies to a limited group of senior serving officials. And then the second category is what we call functional immunity or immunity ratione materiae, which is an immunity that applies with respect to officials that are acting or persons that are acting in the exercise of their official capacity. Okay. 
So first of all, immunity, rationi, material, uh, personae, status-based immunity or personal immunity. As I stated, it applies to a limited group of state officials. The International Law Commission has decided that it applies to heads of states, heads of governments, and foreign ministers, so the so-called troika. Now, this immunity is not just an immunity from prosecution by foreign states, but it also includes what we call the inviolability of the person of the official. So the inviolability of the person of the official when they are abroad, which means that they are also immune from arrest, immune from detention, in addition, of course, to being immune from prosecution. It's usually said that this form of immunity from criminal jurisdiction is absolute in the sense that there are no exceptions to it. And in fact, the International Court of Justice in a case called the Arrest Warrant Case, case between DR Congo and Belgium, held that this immunity continues to apply even when these officials are accused of crimes under international law. It's important to note, though, that this immunity only applies for as long as these officials are in office. So this type of immunity does not apply once they leave office. It attaches to the status of the official, and when they leave that office, this type of immunity no longer applies. The second type of immunity, the official act immunity, or to use the Latin expression, immunity ratione materiae, ratione materiae. This immunity is broader than the status-based immunities that I have just been talking about. And it's broader because it extends to all those who act on behalf of a state. So it applies not just to a limited group of officials, but it extends to all those who act on behalf of a state and prevents foreign courts from exercising criminal jurisdiction with respect to those official acts. So the immunity applies to the act rather than the official, and it prevents states from exercising criminal jurisdiction over the official acts of other states. It applies whether the person in question is a high-ranking official or not. It applies whether they're a serving official or not. However, this type of immunity, it's important to note, only applies with respect to acts that are performed in the individual's official capacity. So in that sense, it is different from the status-based immunities, which apply whether that head of state, head of government, foreign minister was acting in their official capacity or not. This applies only to acts performed in official capacity. However, there's a question as to whether this immunity extends to acts which amount to international crimes. And this is a question that divided the International Law Commission in its consideration of this topic of, of immunity. The International Law Commission actually, today, it rarely votes. Most uh, texts that are adopted by the International Law Commission are adopted by consensus. But on this particular question of whether immunity ratione materiae applies with respect to international crimes, the International Law Commission did vote and was divided on, on the issue. The majority of the commission came to the view that immunity ratione materiae from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction does not apply in respect of a number of crimes under international law. So this is Article 7, which you see on the screen, of the ILC's draft articles on immunity of state officials. So as you see, draft article seven says, immunity rationi materiae from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction shall not apply in respect of the following crimes. And then it lists a number of crimes, genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and, and so on. I have to say that I share this view so I wasn't in the International Law Commission at the time, but I would have voted with the majority. I don't have time to elaborate in detail 
um, on all the arguments, but my view is that both practice and principle suggest that under customary international law, there is no immunity ratione materie with respect to international crimes. Now, a number of arguments have been made with regard to this, um, with regard to this particular issue. I don't agree with all the arguments, but the two that I do agree with is that first of all, there was extensive practice at the end of the Second World War of prosecuting state officials in national courts for international crimes. And that practice assumed a lack of, of immunity. So that's the first thing. The second um, point that I would make with regard to this issue is that the reasons for immunity ratione materiae, the reasons why international law accords immunity to officials with respect to their official act, those reasons do not apply in the case of international crimes. And what are those reasons why we have immunity ratione materiae in the ordinary case? So there are two reasons why international law accords immunity ratione materiae in the ordinary case. The first reason is that individuals are not to be held responsible for acts which are really those of the state. That's the first reason why we have immunity ratione materiae. And the second reason is one that suggests that questions of legality of official acts ought not to be resolved by the domestic courts of, of other states. And neither of these reasons apply in the case of international crimes because first of all, international law ascribes individual responsibility for international crimes. So that first reason that individuals should not be held responsible for acts which are really those of the state, that's been rejected in the case of international crimes. In fact, the essence of international criminal law is that individuals are to be held responsible. They do have that individual responsibility. And then the second reason also doesn't apply because principles of universal jurisdiction already contemplate external scrutiny of the acts of state officials. So I share the view of the ILC that there is an exception to immunity ratione materiae in the case of international crimes. So for the rest of this lecture, I'm really going to focus on the first type of immunity that I spoke about, which is the personal or the status-based immunities that apply to the so-called troika, the head of state, head of government, and foreign ministers. And I will examine the extent to which those officials are entitled to immunity when they are sought for prosecution for international crimes. I'll focus on prosecution before international criminal tribunals, but first I will start with prosecutions before national courts. Now if you go back to the slide that I had on earlier, one of the points that I made with regard to the personal or status-based immunities is that they are absolute in criminal cases. In other words, one state cannot exercise criminal jurisdiction over a head of state or head of government or foreign minister, serving head of state, serving head of government or, or foreign minister of another state. And the ICJ said, as I said in the arrest warrant case, no exception in the case of, of international crimes. However, I think a question does arise as to whether or not these immunities are really absolute. In other words, are there really no exceptions to it? In my view, actually, there is one exception to, um, to immunity ratione personae with respect to prosecutions for international crimes. In the context of an international armed conflict, so a conflict between two states, the parties to, those, to that armed conflict can ordinarily take measures which are inconsistent with the personal immunities that international law provides to serving leaders. You will recall that I said earlier that immunity from the exercise of foreign criminal jurisdiction includes also the inviolability of the person of the official. In other words, they are immune from arrest, they're immune from detention, in addition to being immune from prosecution. However, in the context of an international armed conflict, a head of state who is commander in chief 
and therefore a member of the armed forces, can be targeted with lethal or other force, even though that would ordinarily be inconsistent with the inviolability that international law accords to them. Also, senior government officials, or indeed anyone, can be detained under the law of armed conflict for what we call imperative reasons of security under the Geneva Conventions. And that would apply even in circumstances where that person would ordinarily have immunity ratione persone. That immunity ratione persone would not exclude them from uh, the sort of detention that the law of armed conflict provides for. So there are some derogations from these immunities in the case of parties that are engaged in an armed conflict with each other. And since it is permitted to take even more extreme measures against those who are entitled to personal immunities in situations of armed conflict, I would argue that there's also, that there's no obligation for a state that is acting lawfully, a state that's acting lawfully under the law relating to the use of force to accord immunity from criminal prosecution in relation to crimes committed in that conflict. And indeed, practice during the Second World War confirms this proposition. It confirms the proposition that states that are acting against an aggressor state are entitled to exercise criminal jurisdiction over the leaders of that state. So in late 1944, 1945, the UN War Crimes Commission discussed the placing of criminal charges against Hitler and Mussolini it investigated the question of immunity and rejected its applicability with regard to Hitler and Mussolini. One of the arguments that was the, the German leader and the Italian leader, one of the arguments that was relied on at that time with respect to the rejection of immunity is one that I quote on the screen there. So it was stated that immunity was an accepted principle in time of peace for reasons of expediency and courtesy, vital to peaceful intercourse between nations, but that it ceased to exist in time of war and could not be maintained for the benefit of the aggressor. They went on to say, and I'm still quoting, that the practice of making and detaining heads of state and other state administrators prisoners, such as in the cases of Napoleon I, Napoleon III, King Leopold of Belgium, Rudolf Hess, so they quoted these other cases, were also invoked as evidence that immunity did not exist in wartime. And in addition, the prosecutions at Nuremberg suggest that the power to prosecute leaders of the aggressor state does not cease despite the fact that the conflict has come to an end. Now, it's important that I stress that although this power of the victim state is one that arises because of an armed conflict, because the conflict was thrust upon them. The termination of the war does not bring that power to an immediate end, the power to derogate from those immunities. And although the power to derogate from those immunities in time of war is one that essentially comes from the law of armed conflict, it's important to stress that only a belligerent state that is acting lawfully under the law relating to the use of force can benefit from it. In other words, an aggressor state does not get to derogate from its ordinary obligations under international law because of its war of aggression. So a state acting unlawfully would still be liable for its violations of international law even if it was acting consistently with the law of armed conflict. So it couldn't derogate from its obligations to respect and accord immunity. Now, why have I gone through that exercise? Well, the argument suggests that Ukraine has the power today to prosecute the leaders of the state waging an aggressive war against it, just as international law would not forbid it from taking even more extreme measures, even where those leaders would ordinarily be entitled to immunity. So that's the position before 
national courts. Let me now turn to international law immunities and the ICC. Now, I should note that President Putin is not the first serving head of state who has been indicted by the ICC. The court issued arrest warrants for the then president of Sudan, Omar al-Bashir, issued an arrest warrant for the then leader of Libya, Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, and it also charged um, Uhuru Kenyatta shortly before he became head of state of Kenya, and that prosecution continued even after he became head of state of Kenya. Now, Russia, Sudan, Libya, were not at the relevant times parties to the statute of the ICC. And the institution of proceedings against the head of a state that is not a party to the ICC statute raises difficult questions under international law. So how should the nature of the ICC as a treaty-based institution whose statute only binds the parties to that treaty, how should that be reconciled with the exercise of jurisdiction by the court in circumstances where the legal rights or the legal interests of a non-state party are, are implicated? So there are two questions that we need to separate. One question is whether or not the court has jurisdiction with regard to a scenario. So recall what I said, that the court has jurisdiction over events in Ukraine because Ukraine has agreed for the court to exercise jurisdiction. That's one question. But a separate question is the question of the immunity of the head of a state that is not a party to the statute of the court. And that's a separate question because the immunity of heads of states from the jurisdiction of foreign states is a right that belongs to the state. It's not a right that belongs to individuals. It's a right that belongs to the state. And if that state, for example, Russia, is not a party to the ICC statute, how, if at all, does that state lose its right not to have the head of state prosecuted abroad without its consent? Now, there's a significant difference between the attempt to prosecute the Sudanese president, Bashir, and also the Libyan leader, Gaddafi, because in that particular case, the situation with regard to Libya, the situation with regard to Sudan, those situations were referred to the ICC by the UN Security Council. And so for that reason, some, including myself, have argued that even though those states were not parties to the ICC statute, they were effectively bound by the exercise of mandatory Security Council powers because the situation was referred by the Security Council. And it was argued that that referral by the Security Council had consequences for the question of immunity. But with regard to the situation in Russia, there is no Security Council referral. So there's no way to argue that Russia is bound by the ICC statute, even if the court has jurisdiction over the situation in Ukraine. So the question of immunity of a head of state that is not a party to the ICC statute was previously addressed by the ICC with regard to the Sudanese situation. So the ICC in a case against Sudanese President Bashir, dealt with this situation. And it came to the conclusion that the position of the accused as a head of state did not exempt him from prosecution by the court and did not exempt him from arrest by state's parties. And presumably, the ICC is relying on the same reasoning in the Putin case. However, in my view, the reasoning that the ICC adopted in the Bashir case has some flaws, and this is what I want to examine. So again, let's take a step back 
and let's look at how immunity works at the ICC. So there are two levels of immunity at the ICC. This is now the slide that you see. So thus far, I have been referring to the issue of the immunity of heads of states from the jurisdiction of the ICC, from the jurisdiction of international courts and tribunals. But it's important to note that the question of head of state immunity in relation to ICC proceedings arises at two levels. First of all, there is the question of whether a, a serving head of state is immune from proceedings before the court itself. And then secondly, there is a question as to whether the head of state is immune from arrest by another state that is acting to execute an arrest warrant issued by the court. So two levels at which we can consider this immunity. The first one relates to what is called the vertical legal relationship between the court and the state of the accused. So is the accused person immune from jurisdiction before the court deals with the relationship between the court and the state of the accused, and in the Putin scenario, between the court and Russia. The second issue, which is sometimes described as the horizontal legal relationship, relates to the relationship between the state of the accused and other states. So can another state arrest somebody that the court has issued an arrest warrant for relates to the relationship between those two states. So can South Africa arrest on the basis of an ICC warrant, President Putin deals with the relationship between South Africa and Russia. What obligations does South Africa owe to Russia? And there are two provisions in the ICC statute that address the immunity of state officials. Article 27, and Article 98, and those two provisions deal with these two levels that I have just spoken about. So Article 27.2 primarily removes the immunity of officials at that vertical level that I spoke about. It removes immunity primarily before the court. So it deals with whether the official has immunity with respect to proceedings before the court. Whereas the second provision, Article 98, deals with that horizontal legal relationship. In other words, it addresses the relationship between states and the question of arrest by one state of an official of another state. And so Article 20, sorry, 98, Article 98 requires the court not to request arrest and surrender where the requested state would have to violate its obligations with regard to immunity of third states. So it's addressing that relationship of the two, the two states. And you have the text of the two provisions there in front of you. Unfortunately, the ICC has not always appreciated this distinction between the vertical and horizontal levels of immunity. And furthermore, in the appeals chamber decision relating to Sudanese President Bashir, the court seems to have assumed that an absence of immunity in proceedings before the ICC, in other words, an absence of immunity at that vertical level, would automatically remove immunity that would exist at the horizontal level. In other words, that it would automatically remove immunity that would exist before state authorities. Now the court has dealt with or dealt with a number of uh, requests for the arrest of uh, President Bashir and issued a number of decisions on this question. And in those decisions, it always came to the same conclusion that President Bashir was not immune from the jurisdiction of the ICC and always came to the conclusion that states had an obligation to arrest him, 
But the reasons that it gave in those decisions were inconsistent. It gave different reasons in different cases. And so there were four different theories that the court relied upon. So the first theory was one which was relied upon by the pretrial chamber that issued the arrest warrant for President Bashir. And there, it was stated that Article 27 of the ICC statute provides for immunities, and that was, sorry, uh, provides that, there, that immunities shall not bar the court from exercising jurisdiction. So Article 27 provides that immunities shall not bar the court from exercising jurisdiction. And on that basis alone, the court held that it was entitled to request other states to arrest him. The second theory, and this is the one that seemed to prevail in the end, was one in which the ICC held, and the ICC Appeals Chamber in particular held, that there is no immunity for persons who are wanted for prosecution by the ICC under customary international law. So it didn't actually rely on the ICC statute. Its argument was that under customary international law, there is no immunity before international courts and tribunals. And also that under customary international law, a state that is acting at the request of an international tribunal is not obliged to accord immunity. So it was a theory that was based on customary international law and not on the provisions of the ICC statute as such. Now, the third and the fourth theories rely on Security Council resolutions with respect to the Sudan situation or the Bashir situation. And they um, relied on those Security Council resolutions as a basis for removing the immunity of Sudanese President Bashir, but they relied on those resolutions in slightly different ways. So under the third theory, they justified the lack of immunity on the basis that the Security Council had waived the immunity. That was the basis that they said the Security Council had waived immunity when it imposed an obligation on Sudan to cooperate. And the fourth theory, which was adopted by some pretrial chambers in the Bashir case, it's a variant of the third, but it's a bit different because what it uh, suggests is that a Security Council referral places a non-party in the same situation as a state that has become a party to the ICC statute. Now, I won't really say much more about the third and the fourth theories because they're not relevant to the Russia situation, as there's no relevant Security Council decision in this case. But I'll note that that fourth theory, the one that a Security Council referral places a non-party in the same position as, as a party to the ICC statute. That is a theory that I accept and I have um, developed in my own, my own writing. Okay, so let's now focus in the remaining time that I have. I'll focus on the second of those theories, the argument that under customary international law uh, that there is no immunity before international courts and tribunals. But before I do that, let me address the first theory, the idea that the ICC statute resolves the question and the idea that because of Article 27, there is no immunity with respect to prosecutions for the ICC. So I think with regard to the first one, the, the one relying on the statute, there are two problems with this approach. So the first problem with relying solely on the ICC statute is that, as I said, it fails to consider this distinction between the two levels of immunity. So relying solely on Article 27 does not consider whether immunity needs to be respected at the national level. So it doesn't consider that horizontal level of immunity. It simply relies on the fact that there's no immunity before the court, but it doesn't actually address the question of whether states have an obligation to respect immunity if the accused person comes into their jurisdiction or their territory. So that's the first problem with that um, statutory lack of immunity. 
The second problem with relying solely on Article 27 is that we're talking about the immunity of a head of a state that is not a party to the ICC statute. And so even though the ICC statute may have a provision dealing with immunity, the question that arises is whether that provision in the ICC statute applies to a state that is not a party to the ICC statute. And recall that immunity is a right of the state. It's not a right of the individual, it's a right of the state. And while the court, of course, is bound by its statute, the statute is nonetheless a treaty, and that treaty should be interpreted in the light of other applicable rules of international law. So it should be interpreted in the light of the general rules regarding um, immunity and the general rules about treaties not uh, binding uh, states that are not parties. Now, the second theory, the customary international law theory. Let's analyze that. So this is a theory which the ICC Appeals Chamber settled on in the Bashir, in the Bashir case. Um, and as I said, the ICC held that at the vertical level, that customary international law creates, if you like, a general exception to head of state immunity in prosecutions before international courts. So the ICC was saying that there is no immunity to prosecution before international courts. And then, on the horizontal level, the ICC appeals chamber seemed to assume that if there was no immunity before the ICC, it was then permissible for states to arrest a foreign head of state when that is requested by the ICC. Now, in reaching its decision, the ICC, its decision that there's no immunity before international courts and tribunals, the ICC appeals chamber relied on two points. And there's a third one, which others have also relied upon. So first of all, there was a point of principle. The argument was that immunity is derived from the principle of sovereign equality. And so it only arises between states. It doesn't arise with respect to international courts and tribunals. So the argument was that the position of international courts and tribunals is fundamentally different from the position before states, that immunity derives from equality before state, between states, and that only applies on a state-to-state -state level. It doesn't apply to international tribunals. The second thing that the appeals chamber relied on was practice. It relied on the statutes of previous international criminal tribunals, which provide that the official position of an accused person does not relieve them from criminal responsibility. So you'll see in the statutes of most international courts and tribunals a provision along these lines that says the fact that a person acted in their official capacity does not relieve them from criminal responsibility. A third point that is sometimes relied upon is a decision by the ICJ in the arrest warrant case. And in that case, the ICJ stated that they were dealing with a foreign minister in that case. The ICJ stated that the foreign minister may be subject to criminal proceedings, and I quote, you see the quote on the screen, in certain international criminal courts where they have jurisdiction. So it's sometimes argued that the ICJ has established an exception to immunity with respect to international tribunals. So let's look at the first argument, the argument that says that there's a difference between immunity between, uh, with regard to states and immunity before international courts and tribunals. So that's an argument that says that while international law immunity of foreign heads of states is necessary to prevent national interference, 
in the ability of a foreign state to engage in international action, that this danger doesn't really arise with international courts. But this distinction, to my mind, doesn't really withstand scrutiny because international courts are created by states, as was the case, for example, with the ICC. And so if states cannot individually exercise jurisdiction over foreign leaders, the question arises whether states can do together what they can't do individually. So if immunity exists with respect to states individually, and if none of them could individually exercise that criminal jurisdiction, could they do it collectively? And this is the problem that international tribunals are created by states. And the danger with this argument is evident when you see how the ICC Appeals Chamber defines an international tribunal. So it defines it as a tribunal that is created by two states. So under that reasoning, two states, just two states, can create an international tribunal and then give it jurisdiction over the head of state of a third state. And so if you take this view, the African Court of Human and People's Rights, which now has a protocol dealing with international crimes, it could have provided, it doesn't, it actually doesn't, but it's a regional international criminal court when it comes into force. On this view, it could potentially provide for criminal jurisdiction of any foreign head of state, of any state worldwide with respect to crimes committed in Africa or, or indeed anywhere, anywhere else. Um, and this reasoning does not confine the absence of immunity to international criminal courts exercising jurisdiction over international crimes. Because if the reasoning is that there is no jurisdiction with respect to international courts, then presumably you can have international criminal courts, and they do exist, that exercise criminal jurisdiction over acts that do not amount to crimes under international law. So again, to go back to the African Court on Human and People's Rights, some of the crimes that it has jurisdiction over are actually not crimes under international law. They're just crimes that African states have agreed to. So if there's no immunity before international courts, the question arises whether there'd be a lack of immunity for even those crimes that are not crimes under international criminal law. Now, some have tried to avoid these dangers by suggesting that only a true international tribunal can benefit from this rule that there is no immunity. And it's been suggested that it has to be an international tribunal that is exercising the criminal jurisdiction or the power to punish of the international community. Now, it's actually not that clear what that means, but the critical question that arises is, when would an, a tribunal have this status? When would it be a true international tribunal? So the ICC has 123 states that are parties to it, but there are 70 states, at least 70 states, not parties to the ICC statute would that be a true international criminal tribunal? Now, the second reason for the supposed customary international law rule that there is no immunity before international courts and tribunals, whoops, is one that relates to the statute of previous, I'm trying to use this. I'll say here. Stay here, is one that relates to the statutes of previous international criminal tribunals. So the second point up, up there. And so the argument that was made is that if you look at the statutes of these tribunals, they provide for a lack of immunity. And this is supposed to be evidence that under customary international law, there's no immunity before international tribunals. But there are two problems with this argument. The first problem with that argument is that, first of all, the provisions that the ICC Appeals Chamber referred to are actually not provisions dealing with immunity. They relate to 
what we call the official capacity defense. These provisions say that official capacity does not relieve from responsibility, which is a different concept from that concept of immunity ratione personae. The second problem with that argument is that in all of those previous cases, the state concerned was bound by the instrument in question. In other words, when the instrument provided for what it provided for, it was providing for that position with respect to states that were bound by that instrument. And it doesn't really answer the question of whether a state that is not a party to or not bound by that instrument, whether that state's immunity rights are essentially removed. Now, the third point is the one that I referred to about the ICJ. So the argument that the ICJ in the arrest warrant case has already accepted that there is no immunity before international criminal courts. And the ICJ did say in the arrest warrant case that the foreign minister could be subject to criminal proceedings before certain international criminal courts where they have jurisdiction. Now, in so doing, the ICJ was simply making reference to the fact that the statutes of some courts, like the ICC, provide for no immunity. And in fact, the ICJ did, in fact, cite the ICC statute. So it was simply making reference to the fact that the statutes of some courts, like the ICC, provide for a lack of immunity. The ICJ did not consider whether or not those provisions can remove the immunity of a state that is not a party to that treaty, which is, of course, the critical question here. What is the position of a state that is not a party to that treaty? So I think the words of the ICJ are used to carry more than they can bear, to provide for an argument that goes beyond what the ICJ was providing for. Now, even if the ICC was right, the, even if the ICC Appeals Chamber was right in the Bashir uh, decision, that there's no immunity from prosecution before international court. So even if one accepts that, it doesn't explain how customary international law would allow national authorities to arrest a foreign head of state in support of a request from an international court. So the, the horizontal level of immunity that I spoke of. Remember the starting point, the ordinary starting point is that heads of states are immune from the criminal jurisdiction of other states, including immunity from arrest. And so there needs to be an exception to that rule, that rule that says that one state is obliged to accord immunity to the head of state of another state. Now, I suggested that in a particular context of an international armed conflict between those belligerents, there would be an exception. But more generally, the question is, what would create the exception to that rule? And so the ICC Appeals Chamber decision, um, which relies on practice, even we, if we accept that that practice creates exceptions before the international court, there's certainly no practice that creates an exception to the immunity that exists at the horizontal level, the immunity that one state is bound to accord to another, to another state. And then if the ICC Appeals Chamber was right, that there is no immunity at the horizontal level between states, that would seem to render Article 98 of the ICC statute redundant. Remember, Article 98 provides that the court may not proceed with a request for surrender or assistance, which would require the requested state to act inconsistently with its obligations under international law with respect to state immunity. If the court is right that there is never immunity from arrest with regard to situations where an international court has requested that arrest, then Article 98 is redundant. There, there would be no need for Article 98 in the statute. 
because there would never be a violation of an immunity if the appeals chamber decision was correct. A final point, and I will stop here, or two final points, is the ICC appeals chamber decision is based on a rule of custom international law. But even if that was correct, questions would arise as to treaty-based immunities. So there are situations where treaties accord immunities to state officials, including heads of state. So for example, if you look at, say, the UN General Convention on uh, Privileges and Immunities, it provides for immunities for representatives of a state to an international organization. And that representative could be, for example, a head of state, a head of government who goes to attend, for example, a UN summit, goes to speak at the General Assembly, or there are other treaties of regional organizations that also provide for immunity. Even if there was a rule of custom international law that provided for no immunity before international courts, the question would still be raised about what is the position of those treaty-based immunities? Because ordinarily, those treaty provisions would prevail over a rule of, of custom. So those are some of the issues that arise with respect to the ICC um, decision in the, in the Bashir case. And in summary, my point is that even if the ICC is right, that there's no immunity before the ICC itself, it doesn't address the question of the position that states' parties to the ICC statute find themselves in, the question of whether they, like South Africa, are entitled to arrest uh, leaders of other, other states. That's a question that needs to be analyzed separately from the question of immunity before the ICC. Now, of course, states' parties, and this is the last point that I'll make before question and answer, states' parties find themselves in a difficult position because even if under international law they owe immunities to the foreign state, so even if South Africa owes immunities to Russia, not to arrest, it is placed in the difficult position of now having inconsistent obligations. It has an obligation to Russia not to arrest, but according to the ICC, it has an obligation under the ICC statute to arrest. And so it is in a difficult position where it has inconsistent obligations under international law. And it's hard to think about how you resolve those inconsistent obligations, unless, of course, you were to get a different decision from the ICC. OK, why don't I stop there? And I'd be happy to take any questions or to discuss further any points that, uh, that arise. <laughs>